vital individuals may scatter across the landscape. We expect communities to remain relatively stable. Such places may grow or shrink. Their activities may evolve. Individuals may leave while others arrive. But throughout, most of us believe that our village, town, or city will be recognizably there in the foreseeable future. Occasionally, however, communities cease to exist in any identifiable form, leaving behind nothing but the shell of their previous existence. Our memories of these communities often rest on a few structures and artifacts that subsist in a state of arrested decay. Lone, abandoned houses, or a few walls that survived the ravages of time. But the soul of the place has gone, along with a flight of its people. What remains is often referred to as a ghost town. And such towns hold a certain fascination for those who visit them. There are two good reasons for diving into their stories. The first reason is simply the pleasure of communing with our past, a past that left a few and sometimes mysterious traces. The second reason is to learn what we can from the demise of earlier human settlements, to consider the implications for the future of our own communities, asking especially how their interaction with the natural environment can hasten their demise. If you're driving along someplace and you see an abandoned place on the side of the road, uh, your curiosity is spurred. You want to go check it out and see what happened and see what's there. And just, it's a fascination to see things as they were and as why they're abandoned and to check them all out. Now, when you find a whole town from the West, a ghost town from the 1800s is even more fascinating. The desire to visit ghost towns and remnants of the past is to then uh, uh, dream uh, of having been there or uh, been in a switch situation like that. What I love about ghost towns is going there and imagining what the people were like. And sometimes if you're there at the right time of day, usually at dusk, and the wind's blowing just right, you can hear them. You can hear their voices. Uh, you can hear what life might have been like when the wood was brand new on the doorway and hope sprang eternal and they had their face at the future. And it's almost like going to church for me because you realize this is temporary, and someday it's going to be, people are going to be looking at my doorway in the same way. We will begin by focusing on those American towns that once clustered around the extraction of gold, silver, and of the metals needed to fuel the nation's industrial growth. Many flocked to the mining towns of the West, but this can't have been an easy decision. What kinds of people would do this? Different types of people from all, all walks of life, you know, heading West, all, all seeking something different, whether it be fame, whether it be fortune, whether it be just for a chance for a better life. I believe there's two or three kind of people who uh, came to boom towns and the first is very brave people uh, people who are willing to uh, leave their homes and go someplace that they've never seen before and try to make a living there so that's number one number two is that uh, a lot of people had no choice they uh, didn't have a home he came here with his fascination with minerals fascination with the open space fascination with uh, adventure and excitement and new discovery and getting rich
Well, mining was really brutal, and they were underground, most of them. The ships were long, uh, they were dangerous, there were explosions, uh, people died of suffocation. Uh, they, uh, it, was, it was horrible. Some of those mines were at over 12,000 feet up, and uh, it had to have been hard uh, in the wintertime because to get to the mine, they, they'd go from their boarding house and had to go through tunnels of snow uh, just to get, to get to the mine so they weren't even seeing daylight a lot of times. And then they're in the mine and everything. It had to have been very stressful and very hard. Well, everybody who comes out west wants to uh, reinvent themselves and, uh, and, and make a pile of cash. Um, the majority of them did not. Very few of, of those miners became wealthy. Very few. And a lot of them had left their families back east and rushed out. And, I'll be back, I'll be back, I'll make a lot of money, a little bit, you know, and riches and stuff like that, and I'll come back. And, uh, Often they didn't ever get back. A number of the mining towns developed within the span of a few years, from modest camps into organized settlements and, on occasion, into thriving boom towns. These were the true, though temporary, local beneficiaries of the nation's surging mineral extraction. Boom towns were not just a saloon, okay, and a jail. All right, they were, they were very, they uh, in many ways were very eclectic. You know, you'd have uh, stores that sold uh, really odd things, soaps and uh, figurines and, and, and that kind of a thing. place like Shakespeare really had no law. You know, the only one agreed upon rule that they had in town is if you killed someone, you had to bury them. Uh, this was a pretty rough, rough place to live. And, you know, everyone had to work to survive. And that's why a lot of people became outlaws. You know, why you had an outlaw problem at that time? Because maybe they didn't have a job or didn't have a skill. And they, they had to make money somehow. The history of Castle Dome was that if you did something bad and you were wanted by the law, you would dive in a mine shaft and you'd have your 45 cult with you and uh, nobody's going to go down the ladder with you below with the 45 cult. So they never tried to apprehend people here because they would always go in the mines, they would wait till they got in the riverboat. So in the 1890s uh, there was a guy who had killed somebody here. And he was wanted by the law, and he went in the mine, and he hid out, and then he got out, and then he went through the desert, and they'd usually catch him on the river somewhere. Sometimes, communities had to take matters into their own hands. You had the vigilante committee here at Shakespeare. Um, you know, if you were bad enough, you know, you either, they would either kick you out of town, or they would just hang you. Mm -hmm. You know, usually if somebody was, you know, maybe somebody was just not, not maybe bad enough to be hung, they would try to just encourage them to leave town. And if they didn't leave town and it became a big problem, then you would just be hung. Just the other way. 
you hang from the rafters in here, you know, isn't like uh, a lot of other places. This is, you know, the hanging from the rafters in, in there isn't a drop you and break your neck. It's a pull you up and tie you off. Um, so it would be a pretty horrible way to, to be hung. Um, but uh, there are no tall trees here, so they did with what they had. There was five saloons within a quarter mile of right here. So we know that that was one way they recreated. They would go to the saloon, and they would drink, and they would gamble. Well, the saloons ran 24-7, and uh, no women were allowed. That, uh, if, you see a, if you see a Western and there's women in there, that's uh, post-1890s, because uh, the saloon was the man's bastion of privacy, and they didn't want women in there. The position of women was unenviable during the early days of the mining towns. During the, that first mining boom here, there weren't many women. Uh, we'll just say the women that were here during the first boom you didn't write home to mama about. <laughs> the women that did come west ended up in bad professions, prostitution, uh, working as a laundress, you know, and uh, shabby jobs. A lot went to prostitution at, at young ages, and, uh, and by, the, by the time they were 30 years old, they were old and haggard, you know, from, from that kind of work. As mining settlements further developed, the position of women changed and improved. Prostitution in boom towns is uh, is is an absolute phenomenon, but I don't think it was a, so much an either or that women were driven into prostitution. Maybe, maybe in some areas where it was uh, really destitute, and they didn't have a choice. But I think women had more choices than they did in the East, which was attractive to them, and they had more chance to do more things. Now, one of them may be prostitution. You know, that that, that that's that is an angle that you can make a lot of money at. One of the ladies who ran a saloon here, her name was Carmelita Mayhew, and she was here about 1910. And she owned the uh, saloon and brothel at Castledome. And she was the madam, and she, she stayed here for 50 years. So they had a huge part in molding what happened here. And Eliza de Luz uh, was a very good businesswoman. She started buying up claims. So she controlled all of Castledome from uh, 1900 to 1945, and then uh, when they needed the lead out of here for the war, it, it was, uh, she's the one who opened the mines up so that that could happen. And she would walk along the faults and say, dig here, man. And so the mines are placed here because Eliza Deleuze said, dig here. And so she was a prominent character, so she had a lot of respect from the people. But I still go back to the fact that uh, there was a liberation that was exhilarating out here, especially in the boom towns, because the normal rules did not apply. You didn't have that stinky country club BS that infected so much of the rest of the country. That they uh, were in many ways liberated from the constraints of their eastern sisters, okay? Uh, for one example, uh, western women rode astride, that means with their legs on both sides of the horse, rather than side saddle. And, it, and the, their eastern sisters just were, you know, in horror of this. Sarah Lowndes was born in 1857 in the picturesque region of Staffordshire in England. At the age of 30, she left the English countryside, her friends and her family and set sail for America to marry Richard Bates, an Englishman who had emigrated eight years earlier and whose wife had died the previous year. In 
The long and probably rough sea voyage was followed by a trek across much of the United States to meet her future husband. Richard lived in northern Utah in a small community called Park Valley. Gold and silver had recently been discovered in the area, and Richard, it seems, worked in the mine. The country Sarah encountered was very different from the green and cozy English countryside she had left behind. And this may have looked harsh and forbidding when she first set eyes on it. Until recently, nothing was known about Sarah's life in America. In the late 1960s, however, Richard Fike, while on a hunting trip in Utah, came across an abandoned wooden cabin. As he looked inside it, he made this discovery. The documents, letters, and photos found in this bag, which appears to have belonged to Sarah and Richard's son, John, shed some light on Sarah's life in this remote Utah mining town. Some items, such as Christmas cards, a drawing from a nephew, shopping receipts, and magazine subscriptions, suggest that Sarah led an unexceptional existence. Other items reveal that she faced a painful problem, a lack of acceptance by the rigid Mormon community in which she found herself, and which did not feel that she conformed sufficiently to their norms a problem especially pronounced after she became a widow in 1900. One local Mormon denounced Sarah's housekeeping and cleanliness and even intruded into her home to clean it himself. Sarah complained to her sister Rose and friend Martha in England, both of whom expressed outrage in their letters, and urged her to return home. Dear Sarah, I was both glad and sorry when I received your letter. I was glad because you're leaving America, and although you do not say you're coming to England, I conclude such is the case. And anyway, you will be free from insult here, and that I see is not the case over there. I wish they had got me instead of you, and I would show them right about face. You must try to get away from there as soon as you can. I don't know what you are doing among such people as they are. Can you not try to come to England again? She never did return to England, perhaps now feeling that Utah, despite her difficulties, was her home. Somewhat later, she received an unexpected letter from an aspiring suitor. Dear Madam, Mr. Burgey, a neighbor of yours, prevailed upon me to write to you, in this way introducing myself to you. He tells me that you are a widow lady and are about my age. I am 40 years old and a healthy, strong man. I'm nearly six feet tall, black hair, and wear a mustache. I am a first-class miner and get the best of wages. I am at present working for the Century Mining Company. Mr. Madsen is the manager. Have been in all parts of the country and had a lot of experience in all kinds of work, farms, etc., have made up my mind to settle down if I can get acquainted with a lady about my age. Do you think you would like to get acquainted with a good man? With any idea of uniting again? I am not a trifler, and do not wish you to think I am anything but a true gentleman. I was born in Wales, England, and understand that you are an English woman. 
If you think favorable of this letter, I would be glad to hear from you. And do not think hard of my making bold to write to you, because it is from a good spirit that I do so, with hopes to hear from you, and we both will be benefited thereby. I am yours sincerely, William Williams, Golden, Box Elder County, Utah, Care Century Mine. We can imagine the pains William took in composing this letter, but we do not know how Sarah responded. In any case, there is no record of their marriage. At about this time, too, the local mines went into decline, and Century Mine, William's employer, closed in 1907, a year after the letter was sent. William probably lost his job, and may no longer have been in a position to offer marriage. The region's population drifted away in search of better opportunities, and the town, like others around it, was on the path to becoming a ghost town. Sarah died of breast cancer in 1916, ten years after William's letter. She lies buried in Park Valley's cemetery, next to the plot under which her husband Richard's remains lie. Sarah may not have known much happiness, but she displayed courage and determination, as did so many other women committed to lives in America's remote mining towns, towns whose existence, like that of these women, could be both harsh and short. What happened to the boom towns is that inevitably reality caught up to them, especially those that were uh, tied to uh, minerals, mineral strikes, is you're only as good as uh, the ledge or the, the vein would last. The minerals ran out. Minerals ran out, so they moved on, sometimes moving into a different state. People that would move from mining camp to mining camp back in those days, trying to find what they were looking for. Because mineral resources are finite at any location, mining these resources ensures their eventual depletion, and thus the demise of communities that depend on their extraction. A broader lesson regards the sad impermanence of human ventures and institutions. There's no, no real permanence to anything uh, that we have. Nothing is forever. Nothing stays the same. Nothing's to say that, you know, civilization as we know it couldn't, couldn't fall apart and you end up having to be back in times like this. But to give a glimpse back so we can know what our roots are and what our foundation is and what kind of people they were and how they, how they were able to make it because I would venture to say if you took most people and stuck them in that situation, they wouldn't make it very well. The life and demise of many mining towns was rooted in their relation to the mineral resources on which their existence depended. And someday, the dwindling supply of such resources will disrupt many communities. However, our interaction with a broader natural environment may have an even greater and more immediate impact on our lives.
This was a time when a growing American population meant increasing demand for wheat and other grains, leading farmers to transfer more and more of what used to be prairie land into the service of grain production. In the process, they damaged the land. Relying increasingly on deep plowing and mechanized farming methods, they removed the grasses which previously trapped moisture and held the soil together, destroying the very topsoil required for agriculture. Worsening the problem of topsoil destruction, severe droughts hit the Great Plains in 1930, droughts that persisted through much of that decade. The loose and drought-parched soil turned to dust, as billowing dust clouds carrying the farmer's topsoil darkened the sky. In some regions, 75% of this topsoil was blown away by the end of the decade. By 1934, some 35 million acres of previously cultivated land could no longer be used for farming. With the collapse of agriculture, farmers and many others fled from the Plains states, abandoning their homesteads and heading west. Mainly on Route 66, toward the promised land of California and leaving behind them an environmental catastrophe that they were complicit in creating. As they moved westward, dust bold refugees, derisively called Okies, were rarely welcomed by the locals. Rather, they were viewed as dirty and disease-ridden intruders who would take jobs from the locals, or else as lazy bums who would sponge on government benefits. Though drought and dust bowl ended by the late 1930s, farmers were slow to reverse bad land management practices, and the regions most impacted by the dust bowl saw significant population losses and, in some places, nearly empty towns. Agricultural recovery, 
became apparent only with the 1950s. The life of Dust Bowl refugees presented a picture of human suffering easily identifiable with that of today's refugees, trying to escape grinding poverty and, at times, political violence by seeking opportunity and acceptance in more fortunate societies. A story important to our understanding of human displacements is that of the ancestral Puebloans, previously known as the Anasazi. By the 11th century, many of them had settled in southwestern Colorado, in the area we now know as Mesa Verde. There, they developed a complex and architecturally innovative extended community. Ancestral Pueblo people grew or, or hunted all of their food, uh, so they grew corn, beans, squash, other vegetables. Uh, they kept domestic turkeys uh, as a fe source of insulation, feathers, and also as a meat source. Uh, and uh, uh, hunted large game, uh, well, large and small, uh, rabbits and deer uh, for, again, meat hide, bones, sinew, other raw materials that they needed. There's a pretty strong traditional uh, division of labor between the men's and women's spheres of life. The primary playground for children is actually the agricultural fields. Kids should play in the fields because they keep the deer away and they keep the other critters that, you know, they're the live scarecrows, basically. Uh, a distinctive feature of ancestral Puebloan architecture at the time was the large number of residences built into alcoves of the Mesa Verde cliffs. Having built a successful and complex community, why did its people suddenly abandon Mesa Verde and flee southward, leaving behind a ghost town embedded in the cliff? The move largely coincided with a painful drought during the last quarter of the 13th century, beginning in 1276. But this was only part of the story. Over the course of many centuries, uh, Pueblo society was successful. The population grew, uh, uh, parents had many children that survived to adulthood, more than uh, needed new lands to farm, the society needed to produce more food for uh, everyone to be able to keep going. And so as the population continues to grow, more and more people had to try and make do in land that perhaps wasn't as reliable, uh, more, more uh, susceptible to drought, and so forth. So uh, that when the drought of 1276 came, uh, I think a significant fraction of the population was living on land that couldn't, where it wouldn't produce enough to feed uh, the family that lived there. One of the places that Pueblo people moved during, in the late 1200s is to what is now known as Bandelier National Monument. It's an area in uh, northern New Mexico, north, northwest of Santa Fe, that where the, the, it's on a plateau 
uh, that has canyons cut into it. You know, in some ways it's reminiscent of the environment of Mesa Verde. Yeah. It's interesting to compare the, the environments of the canyons in Mesa Verde and in Bandelier. Uh, the, the canyons at Mesa Verde are of a pretty hard sandstone. The material of the canyons at Bandelier is much softer than it is at Mesa Verde. And so you could, you could excavate uh, a room out of the sides of this volcanic tuff and uh, move into it. For several centuries, farming both the flat mesa tops and the lush canyon bottom ensured enough food for Badalier's people. The problem, and as with Mesa Verde, was that vigorous food production fueled additional population growth, which along with intensive agricultural practices outstripped the land's ability to produce, especially on water-scarce mesa tops. At the same time, improvements in agricultural technology made farming the river plains increasingly attractive. As Pueblo ancestors learned more about the environment of northern New Mexico, they discovered that using the floodplains and digging ditches off of the streams and using the gravels to create uh, microenvironments on the, on the terraces above the streams was a more reliable way to uh, produce food than uh, farming the mesa tops. Agriculture now focused more on river valleys as the ancestral Puebloans moved progressively southward, eventually merging with other native populations in New Mexico and in Arizona. Today, those known as the Ancestral Puebloans or Anasazi no longer exist as an identifiable people. Abandoned by their inhabitants, the cliff dwellings of Mesa Verde and Bandelier remind us, as do the Dust Bowl victims and those who had placed their reliance on finite mineral resources, of how much our existence is shaped by our interaction with our natural environment. My understanding from, from spending time with contemporary uh, Pueblo people is that uh, there's a strong feeling that the human community and the forces of nature are not distinguishable from each other. There's a real emphasis on the wholeness of the human and non-human world. Uh, and there's a strong feeling that when, when nature is out of balance, it is a sign that the community is out of balance as well. Of course, over time, you know, Pueblo people looking back on their history recognize that they have moved a lot, many times and that there's an important value in movement as being a way of uh, addressing imbalances that emerge from time to time. From the beginning, we talk about emerging into this world um, and, uh, um, and starting a journey of migration, seeking a, a place uh, in the world where we are in a, a deep relationship with the land and, and the, the beings that inhabit that land, a relationship of harmony and balance. There's almost nothing that isn't anthropogenic. Um, and so that, that the events that occur in the landscape and the world around us are reflections of human behavior. And so we might say that our lesson today might be that
past is future almost, right? That we have to re-remember those things that made us so uh, uh, incredibly successful as human beings in the past and, and remember how our forgetting of them has been a key element and the predicament that we find ourselves in today. Climate change manifests itself in several ways, and its impact differs in different parts of the world. But it is best known for the rising temperatures it can produce, and it is getting hotter and hotter. Hotter temperatures can cause declining precipitation and increased evaporation of freshwater bodies, such as lakes and rivers. Major American reservoirs are experiencing historically low levels, as exemplified by Lake Mead, upon whose waters 40 million people depend. The predicament of Lake Powell, the nation's second largest reservoir, is equally grim. Heat induced drought not only threatens fresh water supplies, it also endangers our forests. As temperatures increase without corresponding precipitation, the moisture is sucked out of trees, making them more vulnerable to lightning strikes and to human negligence.
paradoxically, if the area is not arid, as in the southwest, but marshy or covered with freshwater bodies, as in parts of the southeast, the heat may lead to more evaporation, cloud formation, frequent downpours, and extensive flooding. Rising sea levels that threaten coastal habitats are also a consequence of a warming climate, a problem largely caused by the melting of glaciers and land-based ice sheets, as water that was once frozen on land is now added to our seas and oceans. Pessimistic assessments predict a possible rise of six to eight feet by the end of the century. Less pessimistic ones limit the expected rise to three feet, which, for example, is approximately Miami's elevation above sea level. Until recently, many Americans had moved in search of sunshine, beaches, or lower taxes, leading them toward areas that are now most vulnerable to environmental deterioration, and which they may soon be most likely to escape. Places they abandon may include those upon which the seas have encroached too far, possibly Miami, Key West, New Orleans, Baltimore, Houston, and other coastal locations. Places left behind could encompass towns like Phoenix or Albuquerque if excessive heat becomes increasingly intolerable. This could also include areas of the West and the Southwest, if people are driven from their homes by recurring wildfires. Where would these people move to? Many people and businesses as well might head toward the northeastern parts of the country, toward places that escape extreme heat, that are distant from the ocean or well above sea level, and that would not object to an influx of climate refugees. These are also places that, while now frigid, could have a temperate climate by the end of the century. Jesse Keenan, a Harvard professor who studied the issue, identified Duluth, Minnesota as a very promising climate haven. Buffalo, New York could also become a climate refuge, and the town's leaders hope that an infusion of a new population may revitalize the city's sagging economy. Other possible climate havens could include places like Cincinnati, Ohio, Ithaca, New York, and Burlington, Vermont.
By the end of the century, many towns could be genuine ghost towns. Tourists may visit their deserted streets. They may peer curiously into their homes and take photos of the town's sad remains. But it is unlikely that such places would be regarded, as were the abandoned western mining towns, as reflections of a romantic past, a past people enjoy connecting to and whose legends, heroes, and villains are celebrated in popular films and fiction. Instead, they will be a depressing reminder of the failings of past generations to address the threats to their environment, of their wish to avoid hard decisions when there was still time to craft a better future. <laughs>